to this month's First Friday webinar. Uh, just a couple of reminders before we get started. Um, about an hour or so ago, you should have received an email from me uh, with a link to today's handouts and the quiz. Um, so if you could please take the time to take that quiz before Sunday evening, um, and then I will uh, get those PDH certificates out to you um, within the month. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, I will go ahead and turn things over to our presenter today. Um, with us we have Ron Peters from Lucid Energy, way out on the West Coast. Um, so uh, Ron, thank you and welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to, glad to be a part of this. This is a great idea. So I, I have up on my screen, I don't know if you can see my screen now, is um, I just did a quick Google search on Gorloff helical water turbines. And this is not in your slide deck, but I wanted to spend a few minutes to give you a little bit of background on Lucid because I think this might be relevant to the, the, the big wind industry you have out there in Illinois. So Lucid started in about 2007 with an idea to make a company selling wind turbines based on the, Cor the Gorloff helical turbine. And as you can see some of the pictures there, it's, it was fashioned around one of the original turbines called a Darius turbine. I don't know if there's any pictures of Darius in there. But Dr. Gorloff figured out that if you twist the blades, then you reduce the torque pulsations on the, on the, on the system and the structure survives much better um, and you can create more, you can drive a little harder and get more energy out of the system. So Lucid Energy started with the idea of using a Gorloff turbine in air. And like most small wind companies, they quickly found out that air is a great medium to push wind turbines around, but you, you really don't make a lot of energy uh, with them. So they decided that, well, what if we put it in water? And so there's a couple pictures, a couple slides of Gorloff turbines going into water systems and power production jumped, went from you know watts to hundreds of watts. But still, I still found that it was not quite making a, you know an economical justification for the system. It wasn't quite there. It still wasn't making enough power. And the other thing that they found out is that when you put things into a river, there are a lot of regulatory requirements that you have to meet, a lot of hoops you have to jump through. We did fish studies, all kinds of things. And it's very difficult to put anything in an open stream waterway. And, you know, of course, the power jumped, but it still wasn't fantastic. And then about 2009, 2010, oh, let me, let me show you a picture. Um, this is actually a lucid test of, a, of our turbine in open water. And about 2010, we attracted the uh, attention of one of the big pipe manufacturers out here called Northwest Pipe. And they said, yeah, that's a great idea putting turbines in a pipe, but you know, the turbine has to be round. And so that was the aha moment that, well, if we made a round turbine, put it in a pressurized pipe instead of an open channel, could we make more power? And so the idea was hatched. They tried it out, and watts went to kilowatts. And so that was the kind of the breakthrough that came about in the development or the evolution of the Lucid system. Started with wind, went to open channel, and then to pressurized pipe. And like most traditional hydro, the power that you extract uh, in most turbine technology comes as a pressure drop. So when you're in a pressurized pipe, you have a lot of energy available in that pipe. And that's kind of how the the Lucid story started. So uh, I apologize, but I want to take you down memory lane a little bit on, on how we got started. It's actually really a wind turbine put into a water pipe with a little bit of extra magic mixed in. So our, our goal, our main philosophy is that we want to harvest renewable energy from gravity-fed water pipes. And we picked gravity, you have to be gravity-fed because you know, Newton said, that you know perpetual motion is impossible. So we've had people say, I've got a pump system and I want to generate some electricity to help feed the pumps. And well, what, what a turbine or what any hydropower device in a pipe will do is actually cause a blockage, make your pump work harder, and you just can't get energy for free that way. So that's why we look for gravity-fed water pipes. 
serving large municipalities. Um, as you know, there's a lot of energy in water. I, there is um, gravity-fed systems, reservoirs up on mountains create a tremendous amount of pressure. You know, every hundred feet in elevation is 43 psi. And if you go out to your house, the meter, and, or put a pressure gauge on your house, it they try to keep it to 40 psi. I think 60 or 80 is the max. So 100 feet isn't very high. Yeah, right? we have uh, you know, 6,000 foot mountains where we have our water, and so most big water systems have too much pressure in their system. And as you know, as when you have excess pressure, the you have chances for leaks and all kinds of problems. Pipe sizes get much thicker, heavier duty. So pressure is great to move the water, but you only need so much to get it to your house. And so they typically or commonly use what's called a pressure reduction valve, a PRV, and to lower the pressure to get it closer to what you need to get it to your house. Now, of course, if you're you know miles and miles from your house, it can't be 40 psi. It needs to be somewhat higher so it can make it to your house. Uh, our Portland project. Uh, right before our turbines, the pressure averages 120 to 150 psi, and you know they need that to get the water to all the locations that it needs to go. But they still use PRVs because that's it's still too a little too high. So a PRV works great. It's a it's a technology that's been around for a long time, um, and what they do is they they change the flow characteristics through the valve such that there's a pressure drop through the valve. But that pressure valve is is as essentially they're he heating the water. It's lost as heat. It, it's energy that they're removing from the pipeline that does nobody any good. It wears out big hundred thousand dollar valves. Um, it's just lost energy. So the Lucid system is trying to extract that energy from excess pressure. Uh, traditional hydro uh, hydropower is not new. Obviously, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, the Romans did it to uh, grind meal, corn, and so it, it's not a new technology, but uh, there are several major categories of turbines that are used for different applications. So head or pressure um, is, is really where the energy is coming from, and there's places that have tremendous amount of pressure but not very much flow. And so there's a Pelton technology, or turbine technology called Pelton, and it, it's really it's like taking your garden hose and blasting a shovel with that water hose. It takes the kinetic energy of that water to, to force the turbine to spin. Because it's an atmospheric uh, event or a turbine, the pressure is actually zero. Or gauge pressure is atmosphere, 14, so that gauge pressure is actually zero. So there's no potential energy in that water. It's all transfer of kinetic energy from that moving water impulsing on the buckets of the Pelton. They call it an impulse turbine for that for that fact. It's it's just slamming into those buckets. Uh, there are other places. A lot of large dams, uh, large reservoirs. They use uh, a Kaplan turbine, and you can go on to Google and just type Kaplan, and it looks like a giant propeller. Um, and they do it because it's for high flow. You know, the elevation of dams where they put the put the turbines could be like 50 feet, 30 feet, 20 feet, but they're moving tremendous tremendous amounts of water. And that uses what's called a reaction turbine. The water reacts with the blades, and it's still taking potential energy out. Um, so. Uh, because there is a, a pressure drop through a Kaplan turbine, but it's really for a high flow, low head application. And then kind of in the middle is what's called a Francis turbine. It's one of the most popular turbines because it has a wide operating range and it's kind of a combination between potential and kinetic energy. It does a little bit of both. And you can see great big giant Francis turbines as well. Um, if you look at that chart, you can kind of see where Lucid lives. We kind of right in the middle of the flow and head. And the reason why we're, we're right in the middle is because we're targeting water transmission systems, large pipelines that are moving water from one reservoir to another or from reservoir to you know, a water treatment plant. And those usually fall in the medium flow, medium head regime, and that's where the Lucid, lucid turbine uh, works. 
So it, ours is a turbine because it is, it is a blade, a wind turbine modified for water. So it's a reaction turbine. And the energy, we don't, we don't, we rely on the velocity of water to spin the turbine, but the energy is extracted as a head drop, a pressure drop, so that is potential, potential energy. That's, that's the energy that we capture out of the pipeline. So one of the key differentiations, because we had a lot of people that know a lot about traditional hydro, and uh, the Lucid system is a little bit different in that we take out very little pressure. There's a very minimum pressure drop when we're operating and almost zero pressure drop when we're stopped. So what, the reason why that's important is because water operators, their job is to move water. Their job is not to you know, spin a turbine. So what they are interested in is having enough flow and enough pressure to get the water to where it needs to go. And so if you start putting turbines in the middle of a, a pipeline feeding a city, uh, you're taking out almost all the pressure, and so you don't have enough energy left in the water to keep it going to where its final destination needs to be. So the Lucid turbine, it only takes out about 5 PSI when we're running. And that is very helpful for a water utility in that they have some excess pressure, but we can't take it all. And if you put a traditional turbine in the middle of a city water transmission system, the pressure would go to zero. They, traditional turbines are extremely efficient at what they do. They take out all the pressure, all the energy they can, because that's their job. But that doesn't work in the middle of a city. So that is the the key differentiation for our technology is if you look at the chart, those three lines, I don't know if you can see them, represent the hydraulic grade line, the pressure it, in feet, and that the horizontal line is what their minimum is. And so if you look at the flow rate along the bottom, of course, if you're moving just a little bit of water, then the, uh, the, the head hydraulic grade line is very high. You get a lot of pressure, no problems. As soon as the flow starts increasing, of course, then you're your, uh, your pressure starts dropping in the system. And so those, the, green, the green line is, is their, just their piping system through the valves running down the pipeline. And that crossover point happens about 33,000 gallons per minute. Uh, if you have our system off, it's like 32,000, 32,5. And then when our, pressure, when our system's on, it drops to about 32. But since those lines are so closely grouped, it allows water operators to still deliver water um, with our system in line. They have to open their valves a little bit more to get the flow they want, but they can still operate. The black line is kind of my artist rendition of what a traditional hydro would do. If you turned it on, it would, it would drop immediately because that's, like I said, their job is to take all the head, all the pressure out. So that doesn't allow a water operator to do his job. If you have to deliver 30,000 gallons a minute, put a tr traditional turbine, you can make a lot of power, but you know, you're stuck with 18,000, let's say, gallons per minute. That's not enough water. So we'll go a little bit onto the turbine itself. As I said, we started off in the wind in this industry making uh, wind turbines off the, off the, the Gorloff design principle. And it's like any airplane wing or propeller blade. It's it's an airfoil. Uh, we uh, we modify it. That's you know that's where our technology comes in. It's not a simple airfoil profile that you pick a NACA profile and, and, and make it work. You you will get a turbine to turn, but you, your efficiency will be pr pretty low. So what we have done is modified the blade profiles, NACA profiles, to work optimally in water and also when they're wrapped into a ball, which adds a little bit of complexity. And so there's a lot of a lot of the literature on lift and drag. And what we're interested in is the amount of leading force, resultant force that provides torque to the turbine. So there's a lot of force generated in lift, but the lift doesn't do any good unless it's creating torque. And torque is that little perpendicular piece to the axis of rotation that actually provides the power for us. Um, the water flow, it, like, like an airplane wing, it's all about angle of attack and the direction of the water flow. What's different between an airplane wing though is it's horizontal and its angle of attack is relatively fixed. You know, the, the plane 
rise, uh, take off and landing, it changes, but it's relatively fixed. For us, because the turbine is rotating in a circle, the angle of attack changes constantly, and then it, it goes to the backside or the downstream side of the turbine, and then we have turbulence. So it's a very complicated uh, flow analysis. Uh, we commissioned uh, one of our universities out here. We got some government money for them to develop a CFD model of our turbine, and they spent a year, and they couldn't do it. So we are developing now some numerical tools to help us model the, the performance of the blade. Historically, what we've done is testing. So that little chart in the bottom of the middle there, there are three, three curves on there. One is the torque that we're creating. One is the net power that we're producing. The other one is the pressure. The differential pressure is like the pressure drop how much pressure we're actually extracting from the water. And as you can see, the green line being torque, um, oh, on, on the bottom, the, the bottom axis is, is same as wind industry, it's tip speed ratio, and that's the velocity of the blade with respect to the velocity of the fluid, water in our case. And so when you have a tip speed ratio of one, that means the blade is moving exactly the same speed as the, as the fluid. If you can kind of read out those numbers, we operate more in the uh, six range, four to six. So our blade is spinning four times faster than the water is moving. It, it really moves quickly. So, and the red curve is the power. So you multiply the torque times the RPM. And like everything else, it has an efficiency curve. We peak torque at about four, peak power closer to six. Uh, but that, and then it drops off because the efficiency goes to zero. Sorry, I had to let out my cat. Um, so, but as even though we're extracting zero energy, useful energy, if you look to the far right, the pressure extraction, the differential pressure, is still going up with RPM, but it's not it's being lost as, as turbulence, as heat. It's not useful energy. We can't use it. Um, all that's doing is causing a pressure drop in the pipe and causing a lot of stress and excess force on our turbines without creating any useful power. So of course, like everything else, there it has an efficiency curve. So we try to control our system to be near that four to six range to keep the pressure differential uh, at its lowest and keep the efficiency at its highest. And so that's the, the trick with our control system is to try to operate in that regime. The, the takeaway to this is that like uh, wind turbines, we spin a lot faster than the water. So I don't know how many of you have looked at hydro or wind turbine equations uh, for power. There are two equations that, the, that you can use. Hydro is a linear equation. There's efficiency, density, gravity, flow rate, and head. And you multiply all those out and you get the power, uh, power that you can extract from the water. So the efficiency, um, well, I'll, I'll go down to the wind equation. The wind equation is a little bit different. You see it has a, related to flow is the velocity. So Q in water is you know, flow rate, so that's, that's a velocity type component but it's a linear equation. You go to wind and it's a cubic relation with uh, velocity of the air. And the, the big difference with that is because water is an incompressible fluid and when you put water in a pipe it doesn't have anywhere to go. And in wind turbines the wind can go, it'll take it the path of least resistance and it'll go around your turbine and not make useful energy. And that, its equation is cubic. So it's kind of strange. Our turbine should follow the standard hydro equation because it's in an incompressible fluid, it's in a pipe, it has a flow rate, it has pressure. So you think our power curve would be a linear equation, uh, but it's not. Because we use a wind to blade technology, our turbines follow more closely the wind equation. The red curve there is a power curve and it's a cubic function of flow rate and the pressure drop is a, a square term, it's polynomial relationship. So it's a little bit different um, than standard hydro in that we have that cubic relationship with flow. 
So of course we want our flow to be the highest that we can get um, and control it up towards that curve because the flow drops off, the power drops off rather quickly. So obviously the difference is density, you know, water is a thousand times more dense than air, so that, that gives us a, a bump up in power. Standard hydropower is the efficiency, you know, the big, big turbines that go in dams, they can approach 95, 98 percent. They're taking out all the energy in that water that they can. They are fantastic machines these days. Uh, in air, though, it's different. There was a gentleman, a professor by the name of Betts. I don't know what his first name is, but Betts created this theoretical, theoretical maximum power that a wind turbine can extract. And it's 59.3 percent, and I could not tell you how he came up with that number, but that's the number. And so the best a wind turbine can do is this Betts limit, and of course nothing is that great. So it's it's a small fraction of the energy of air is actually uh, converted into energy, and that's why you see um, wind turbines have to be so massive because they can only extract, you know, 40 some odd percent of the energy in the in the wind in the air and the density is so low they have to make them giant to get to get a megawatt class turbine whereas a megawatt class hydro turbine is much smaller just because the density of water is is so much higher and the efficiency is a lot a lot greater For the Lucid system, um, this is a quick chart. This is what today's system uh, can do in terms of pipe size and power per turbine. And we have found that 24 inch um, pipe is, is kind of the economic threshold. With all the equipment, all the steel you need and all the power electronics you need to make a, a turbine system, going below 24 it starts to become kind of tricky to make it pencil out. You know, dollars per kilowatt in any renewable energy is the golden metric. You know, levelized cost of electricity is the golden metric. And it, we have found that it's really hard to make those two metrics, the cost per kilowatt and the LCOE, pencil out with pipelines smaller than 24 inch. Which it is kind of a problem because large pipelines are few and far between like that 60 inch, we can make a lot of power in a 60 inch pipe, but there's not a lot of 60 inch pipes around the country moving you know, millions and millions of gallons of water, 125 million gallons a day, and that's a lot of water. And so we were talking to uh, Boston actually, and they had a 60 inch pipe feeding Boston that they were interested in, in putting our turbine in, or actually we were interested in putting our turbine in. And when you get to pipe sizes that big, those are mission critical pipes. They have one feeding Boston, the 16 inch pipe. And they said, well, what if something happens? And of course we tell them it, there's, it's really simple technology. There's not many moving parts. It, there's only stainless steel and fiberglass parts in the, in the pipe. Uh, but they said, you know, this is mission. We can't have this pipe go down. So, Bigger pipes have a lot more potential to make a lot more energy, but you also have a water industry that's a little bit risk averse, and putting anything in a drinking water pipe tends to make them cringe a little bit. So their job is to deliver water, their job is not to create energy. So that's it's another one of the challenges that Lucid faces, is finding water industries that are forward thinking and realizing that you know 60 percent of their cost is electricity to move the water and yet they have a lot of energy in the water that they can take out. But their job is to deliver water, not to make electricity. So finding the right application, the right mindset, the forward-thinking water utilities is really beneficial. Finding areas that have high cost of energy um, is also crucial. So each one of those turbine sizes of 1450 and 100, those are all taking just a small amount of pressure out of the system. If you put a traditional hydropower system into a big 60 inch pipe, you're probably approaching megawatt uh, power, but again, it's blocking the flow of water and you can't put it in the middle of a water transmission line. There's a big... Um, Trying to predict how much power and energy you can get from a system is, is pretty tricky 
because water flow and pressure change constantly. Here in our system in Portland, in the summer months, everybody's watering their lawn, washing their car, and the flow goes up tremendously and we're making a lot more power. In the winter, like in fall, um, not so much. So in that chart, what you see, the green lines are an actual flow rate distribution. And married over the top of it is a power curve. So if you see the green bars at the far end, that closer to four cubic meters per second, we can make a lot of energy. But most of the time, they don't have that flow. So their energy creation or energy production is going to be a lot lower. And so the chart on the bottom, you can see it's a four-year running average of this pipeline that we were investigating. And the, the deviation in flow is, is crazy. If you look at just in January, the last 2014, it went to zero. And so we don't quite understand how that can happen. But each month, each year, it changes wildly. So you, you have to be really cognizant when you're talking to people about how much energy they can realistically produce. And so one of the factors, or one of the terms that they use is capacity factor. And like I said, the water water is, is always flowing. You know, the, the pipelines in Portland are always running water. People are always flushing their toilet. But it's still variable. And that can cause your capacity factor to drop. If you look, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at their nameplate capacity, it says 360 kilowatts. And that would be if you had four turbines and they were running max flow all the time, which of course can't happen, doesn't happen. So our actual average capacity is only 113, in this pipeline, only 113 kilowatts. So, you know, it drop it by about a third. And then when you look at solar and wind, it's even worse or harder because, you know, the water, the water is always flowing in our pipelines, but the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And so what they typically use, government numbers, are the solar and wind capacity factors are about a third of hydro. So even though we started with 360 and went down to 113, um, it's still three times more than a solar application. So if you had a 300, if you wanted a 360 kilowatt, I'm sorry, let me turn that off. I apologize. So let's say you had a 100 kilowatt nameplate rated system. If you wanted to put a solar or wind farm up, you would have to pick, you'd have to size it for 300 kilowatts to get that effective capacity of 100 kilowatts. So that's why hydro is much more efficient at making energy is that it, because it's, it's usually always flowing. Um, solar and wind, they have to size them bigger, three times bigger to get the same capacity factor as a hydro power system. Um, but you know, each renewable energy has its place and places that are, are flat and don't have a lot of gravity fed systems or large pipelines, because they have a lot of sun shining or they have a lot of wind blowing, it makes, you know, it, it's all, hydro is just one piece of the puzzle. And the trick is finding out which piece works best in your application. And, and this, is, this chart is just to show you that you, you have to be careful. It is it's kind of tricky you can get deceived rather easily when you're sizing hydro components or sizing anything. Oh, the wind is always blowing at 100 miles an hour. Well, that's usually not the case. Water is always flowing at a million gallons a day. and that, Well, that's not usually the case either. So that's one of the things that we, one of the tools that we've created is to look at what the real power production is going to be, is going to be. And at the end of the day, you make money or you save money on the megawatt hours or kilowatt hours you use. Just because a system is rated to be a, a bazillion kilowatt turbine, if it's not running and you're only generating out power one hour out of the year, then your kilowatt hours, your megawatt hours is, is nothing. And, and that's, that's where you make money. You, you, your electric company charges you per kilowatt hour. And so just because you have a million kilowatt turbine, Unless you're running all the time and making kilowatt hours, you're not doing any good. So we've come up with this tool that um, what's common, people come to us and they tell us our average flow is this, our pr average pressure is that, and that's fine. We can tell you what your average power
power is going to be, but if you want to calculate what your energy creation is going to be, we need uh, a timestamp data. And some water municipalities have it, some don't. Um, they track water hourly, some do it daily, some do it weekly. It, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot. But what we do is we take uh, ideals to have hourly data for several years like this chart has. This is data 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for four years. And so we calculate how much energy can be created in each of those hour slices. So what that number, that 996 megawatt hours represent is four year period with all your varying flows, that's what you will make in an average year out of your system. So it's, it's a really critical part because people, and especially with renewable energy, wind power, solar, people get burned often by, um, it's, a, you know, it's like I said, it's a million kilowatt system, but what they don't tell you is it's never running, and so you're not really making any, any energy. So the real trick is finding good, accurate data to calculate how much energy you're going to be producing. Not how big or how much power it can produce, but how much energy will it produce. That's a, a very important part of the process for sizing a hydro system, or any system. Um, a little bit into the specifics of our system. Um, we sell a couple different variations. Uh, one of the more popular, most popular one is a grid tied system. And that's when you're actually running your power back into the main national grid, so to speak. Uh, the grid is like an infinite um, pool of energy. And so since our system is, is relatively small, you know, it's only, our Portland system is 200 kilowatts, it's, it's like a drop in the bucket. Uh, so what they call it, they call it a stiff grid, meaning we, it's like throwing a rock, a pebble, or a pail of water into the ocean. They can accept as much power as we can create, they accept as little power as we can create. It's a stiff system, it doesn't matter how much we're putting on the system. And that's, that's ideal, because um, large power generation sources now, I mean, the electric utilities are pushing for battery storage, even for large wind and large solar, because they can't have, they can't manage a system where it's a million kilowatts at 2 o'clock to zero kilowatts at 2.30, you know, with the wind stopped blowing and the sun, cloud comes over your solar array. So being a, tied into a big grid, a stiff grid, is, is a much easier proposition for us to do. And we do it uh, like, like a a lot of wind industry, small wind industry does. We get, uh, you know, we spin the turbine, the water spins the turbine, spins the generator. Generator, though, spins as fast as the turbine spins, uh, which is a little bit different than big wind. They try to control it to be within a limited RPM range, and that's because they use um, asynchronous motors, induction motors tied to the grid. Our system, we do it a little bit differently. It's more towards, more geared for um, like small wind does it, where the, we just let the generator spin at whatever RPM the turbines happen to be pushing it, and then we take that, that AC power off the generator, we call it wild AC, uh, because it, it's varying in frequency, it's varying in amplitude, it, it's really unusable. You can't plug your, your laptop into one of our generators, because it, it's, it's, you know, it, it just changes constantly, frequency and voltage level. So what we do is we put it through what we call our front end. And the front end is really a, a motor module. It's a driver to help control the turbine. And it also takes that AC power and rectifies it into DC power, which is um, then sent to what we call back end. And the back end has two jobs. It, it looks on the grid to see that a grid is present. It finds out what the phase is of the power in, in the amplitude. You know, it's 120, 60 hertz, but you know, what phase angle is it at? You have to match a phase angle as well. So the back end looks at the grid, synchronizes the, the voltage and frequency, and then turns on the power, opens up the faucet, and lets the power flow through the system. Most of our systems are 480 volt, three phase uh, systems. We, in poorly, we run it underneath the street up to a power pole, 
up to um, transformers on the power pole that step it up to whatever transmission voltage they they have at that site and send it on down the line. Um, so this is a common methodology. It, it's a little bit, you know, it's, it adds one level of complexity going from AC to DC to AC, but the, it's it's very straightforward and simple. And we don't have to run the turbines at a fixed speed. We can let them run at any speed. They, the water happens to be pushing them. So it makes it a lot easier to optimize the turbine if we allow it to run at whatever tip speed ratio, that RPM velocity thing. If we allow the generators to run and the turbines to run in their peak efficiency, peak power modes, uh, no matter what the water flow is, and so we don't we don't really care what RPM they're turning. We don't they don't have to be matched to the grid, and so that gives us flexibility to to operate in a wide range of flows and pressures. Uh, the one thing that is required there's a, an IEEE standard for uh, interconnected power sources. And of course, all our systems have to meet that. Um, the UL standard is a UL1741, but it, the UL is just a, a testing agency that verifies that you met the IEEE 1547. And the big one with that is um, any renewable energy represents a second source of power. So if um, the main power line, there's a fault on the, on the grid and the power goes out, and you send out workers to go fix that grid, you can't have another power source feeding energy, feeding electricity onto that grid uh, from a second source if you're going to have workers uh, out there working on it. So they have what they call anti-islanding, anti where you can't have an island of power if, if the main, main island drops off. So that's, that's the big, big thing that you got to look out for grid tight systems, that you meet this IEEE for anti-islanding. So our system has the power electronics, like I said, the back end senses when the grid is, is up and running, and it senses when the grid goes down. And we have a fail-safe system that when the grid goes down, in a quarter of a second, our turbines stop. And it's, we did some live testing for our power company. Our power utility out here is PGE, and one of their requirements was a grid loss test. So they simulate the grid going down, which was throw the big breaker up at the street, and your system, you have to prove that your system won't uh, in, inject energy onto a down grid, and it has to do so quickly. And so we try to go as fast as possible because with our lift-based turbine, we're operating about 250 RPM in an eighth of a second, so that quarter second that it takes for us to stop the turbine has ramped up from 250 RPM to 500 RPM, doubles the speed in an eighth of a second, 0.125 seconds, and it just wants to take off. It, it's, so what that does is it creates a lot of stress on the components. The differential pressure, if you remember that old chart, the blue line, the pressure goes way up, and that represents large forces on our turbine. So we don't want it to, to run in what's called free spin. So we break it in a quarter of a second, the thing slams to a stop using an essentially big truck disc brake system. Clamps the system to a halt in a quarter of a second, and that ensures that there's no power being put onto a down grid, which follows that IEEE system. The, the, the braking system, it has to be fail safe, so it, it's, it's, it's spring operated disc brake, massive die springs push these calipers pads onto a massive disc brake. And we use a hydraulic system to keep the brakes open. So if there's a lot, loss of power, loss of hydraulic fluid, loss of hydraulic pressure, the system goes into a fail-safe and it clamps the system shut and stopped. And a couple of good things about that is with the Lucid turbine, remember it's based on a wind turbine, it's really open and the pressure drop is minimal close to zero when we're stopped. Uh, traditional hydro, if you stop uh, uh, Kaplan, Francis, or Pelton, if you stop that system, then uh, the pressure, you almost stop the water as well. And so when they go into a runaway, the pressure spikes and you can get water hammer in a system with traditional hydro if you lose grid power. And so they have to go through these extra safety valving and other tricks to prevent water hammer during a runaway. For our system, actually, 
we we don't have water hammer. We actually lower the pressure in a pipe in Renaway. When we're stopped, it's zero pressure drop. Water utilities like that. Some places have what's called fire flow requirements, and that's absolute. Sorry, that's an absolute maximum flow of water that they have to have in case there's a large fire. And so they will turn, even though our turbines are still only taking out 5 psi per, per turbine, it still represents a little bit of blockage in the pipe and we have to stop to meet their fire flow conditions. And the beauty with our system is it's inline, you can stop our system and we go to nearly zero pressure drop so they can meet their fire flow requirements without having to have a bypass circuit in their system. Okay, sorry, a little bit off topic. So the other type of system that is um, what we sell is what's called off-grid. And it's the same front end, the same turbines, same generators, same front end motor modules, all of those are the same. But then we take off the back end, power electronics, and use what's called charge controllers that are effectively control the charging of a battery pack. It's a, uh, an attractive idea for piece of people behind the grid or need um, or employing battery packs. There's a thing called peak load shaving where companies have um, you know a certain um, not quota, uh, allotment of energy. And if they go over that allotment of energy, the power company charges them more, a lot more for that power. And so what's becoming uh, popular in some large industrial settings is they will actually add a solar or wind or hydro or something and a big battery uh, pack, size of shipping containers. And they use that for peak load shaving. So when they're energy demand spike, they are actually running off batteries to avoid jumping into that higher cost energy system that the utilities will charge. So this one guy was telling me that their their normal energy bill averages around $300,000 a month. If they go over their allotment, it's an extra $400,000 a month. So their energy price goes from three hundred dollars to 700000 if they if they start using too much energy. So one of the uses for the Lucid system can be for these peak shaving applications where, they're, where you're charging a battery pack. Another application is like EV charging stations. Um, the goal of a, a, a car charging system is to be able to charge your car in the same amount of time as it takes to fill up your gas tank. And I heard a report that Beijing by year 2050 or 2030 something, Beijing, the city of Beijing, is going to outlaw gasoline-powered cars. And you can only have electric vehicles in the city of Beijing. And so what they're doing now, the big push is when you pull up to a gas station, it takes you, what, five minutes to, to fill up your tank? They're pushing to get car charging stations to fill your battery in the same five minutes because no one can wait hours while you fill up your car, right? That's just not going to work. So the trick to getting faster and faster charging is to go direct DC um, charging systems. So on board most electric cars now, there's a little charging conversion thing that you can plug it into your house. That's AC. It goes through its own little rectifier and uses DC to charge the batteries. The rate that you can charge those batteries is limited by that, that rectifier system. So what the, the fast car chargers are doing, Tesla's doing, is they're going to straight DC charging of car batteries. And so that's ideal for our system in, because that we can take off our back end power electronics, AC, the stuff that makes it AC power, and feed directly DC. So skip that step entirely. So it's real advantageous for fast car charging to have a large amount of DC power available. And that's um, one of the applications that we're looking to as well. Because car charging stations, you know, if it's still a coal-fired plant that's feeding this charging station, then are you really a green energy? Not, not quite. I mean, electric cars are fantastic for emissions and saving on fossil fuels if you can feed the charging station with a renewable energy like wind power, solar power, or, or hydropower.
and so that's another one of the markets that we're looking at. Uh, one of the things that we're kind of proud of um, is that we manufacture the systems in in the USA. There's a little town north of Portland called Scapoose, Oregon, where where the turbines are assembled. The power electronics come from Siemens, so they're they're German. Um, but um, we're looking at alternate power electronics as well. Siemens is a fantastic system, reliable, world renowned world of availability. Um, someone once told me that I had a question on mean time between failure and so I posed the question back to to Siemens and said what on on this power electronics package what is your mean time between failure and he said uh, we calculate it to be 156 years. <laughs> I said well uh, I don't think there's anybody around that can uh, verify your claim but I'll take your word that it's pretty reliable. So Siemens is a fantastic uh, set of equipment, but when I say world-class electronics at a world-class price, and so that's one of our challenges as well, is to, to look out to see what else other uh, power conversion options are out there. But all the metal and, and fiberglass that goes into the system is all made in, in Oregon. Uh, those pipes that you're looking at actually came from California, but they're all sourced here in the U.S. Uh, that system that they're working on right now is our 42-inch system. That's actually the system that was installed in Portland. And as you can see, they're, they're pretty big water pipes. It takes a lot of water to make a lot of energy. Which leads me to the wrapping up here. So we have two commercial installations right now. One is in Riverside, California. It was kind of our proving ground. Uh, they were they had this water pipeline that it, that fed this agricultural um, area. It wasn't super high flow, it wasn't super high pressure, but they were willing to put us into a bypass and let us prove out the system and in turn we um, donate the power to the city of Riverside for their for their lighting, street lighting, and they allow us to go in and we put in three different generation products in there for 20,000 plus hours. The capacity factor utilization rate you know, is 87%, so it's really high. It hasn't created a ton of energy. 71 megawatt hours is not very much, but it, again, it's a it's a single turbine low flow application that helped us uh, prove out our technology and start getting the word out that there is a way to make energy in pipes. Our flagship installation is the one that we did in Portland. Here uh, went online December. Uh, 2014, so it's coming up on two years of operation now. And uh, Portland Water Bureau is our, our water company. We have a our water comes from Mount Hood, a big mountain uh, nearby or near to us, and it comes through the Bull Run Reservoir system, and it feeds a, several different other reservoirs, which feed other reservoirs, which feed the city. And so this Conduit Three was a big hundreds and hundreds of million dollar project to bring a new reservoir online and so we're in the middle of this water transmission system that feeds Powell Butte Reservoir feeding Mount Tabor Reservoir I think it is. So it's one reservoir to another and all they do is monitor reservoir levels and put more water or less water through 24 hours a day continuously monitored through these big 48 inch pipes uh, underneath the city. So that picture is we're underground. It's put into a, uh, a vault that's 40 feet by 15 feet by about 10 feet high. It's massive. It was a massive hole in the ground. It was quite quite the ordeal. But um, one of the other aspects of the system is, as you can see looking down the pipe, it's, it's pretty open. So what we had, uh, what we did is we installed the pipes um, when PWB, Portland Water Bureau, was doing their pipe run, when they're installing their pipes, we found out about it. We found out that they had too much pressure, they were going to put a PRV. Found out that they're going to rip up the street, putting in this, this system. And so we said, well, our system would fit perfectly in front of your PRV. It will help take out some of the pressure. It looks like just another pipe spool going in. So it's flanged just like uh, any other pipe spool. So as quickly as they are dropping in pipe is pipe is how quickly you can drop in a lucid system. 
uh, with that fail-safe break I was telling you about, uh, the system remains parked uh, in a locked position, but we're only losing about a PSI of pressure when locked, but it allows the pipe spool to be installed and the water turned on in a minimum amount of time. As fast as the pipe layers can do it is, is how quickly you can get the water up and running. So then what we do after they got installed and after the water was running is then, then we installed the generators and all the power electronics and did all the commissioning while the water was running. So that's a huge deal for water utilities. You know, they're, they're always under time pressures to get water flowing again, get a city serviced. So with the Lucid system, you can drop the pipe in, get the water running, and then we can do the power electronics on an as needed or any other schedule that they have. So that, that is another, um, another beauty of our system. The Portland system that went in December last year, or 2014, four turbines, 50 kilowatts each, 200 kilowatts total. Uh, with the flow rates that they have, we predict, projected them to be running about 1,100 megawatt hours a year. And depending where you live, how much energy you use, that's about 150 homes that we're servicing in the Portland area with, with our system. And with that, I am finished. So what time do we have? 10 minutes. So if there are questions or things you want to ask, go ahead and let Courtney know, and I'll answer as many as I can. All right, we've already got a couple questions that have just come through. Um, one of them is uh, with pumps, uh, you have to consider cativation. Um, do you take this with, into account with your lucid system? Yeah, that's a very good good topic. Cavitation when pumps, yeah, it's definitely a problem. And our system behaves like a pump. And yes, it does uh, experience cavitation if you let it spin too fast. As as if you can recall, the faster we spin, the more pressure we take out. And once you drop below the vapor pressure of water, then the cavitation occurs. So we've done a lot of cavitation studies. And our system doesn't cavitate until you go into a runaway situation. So during normal operation, we, we, we don't cavitate. We don't even, there's no threat of cavitation during normal operation. As a backup, we have a cavitation monitoring system. It's a high frequency um, accelerometer system, pressure. We can monitor pressure as vibration. And so our system has an anti-cavitation system that in the event that it senses cavitation is imminent, it'll start slowing down the turbine. So where that becomes important is if uh, we're, we're spinning too fast or the local pressure in the water is too low. If the water pressure starts off low and we're taking out a lot of pressure with our system, then you start to approach that vapor pressure point where cavitation can start. So system pipelines that have low starting pressure, low gauge pressure, are more prone to cavitation. So that's why we've installed an, an automatic control system to watch for it and to guard band against it. Um, someone else asked, um, is pipe section removal required to inspect or repair uh, the actual turbine? For normal service and maintenance, no. Because the, the what's in the pipe, they call it the wetted components in the pipe, our NSF 61 drinking water safety standard approved materials of fiberglass and stainless steel. And as the turbine shaft exits the pipe, the first thing it goes through is a high pressure seal. So inside the pipe, there is nothing but inert material, the stainless steel shaft and the fiberglass blades. And so any bearings, generators, brake system are all outside the pipe. So there is absolutely zero service required inside the pipe. We do have a recommended maintenance schedule that every 10 years you inspect and or replace the seals. And for those situations, yeah, the water has to be off to replace those seals. And that's, that's the only reason why you'd ever turn the water off in the system. Um, and then someone else asked, did Portland still install the PRVs in their system? And did they need them after the installed lucid system? Right. Yes, they did still install it. It was done as um, most of, more or less a safety precaution because our turbines are meant to, to turn off 
and they still need to monitor pressure. So if they have a fire flow or for whatever reason we are, you know, have their turbines turned off, they still need 100% assurance that they can control the pressure. So they put in, they still use the PRV as kind of a redundant safety mechanism. Well, Ron, those are the only questions that we got. Um, unless there's anything else that you wanted to add, I think we can probably wrap it up. No, I, Courtney, thank you for setting this up. Thank you for inviting me. It's been uh, my pleasure to speak about the Lucid system. I think it's, we think it's a fabulous system, uh, but it's, it's you know, kind of a niche product. It goes, doesn't go everywhere, but I thoroughly enjoy talking about it and trying to let people know about our product and hopefully keep it. Keep the lights on for us. Absolutely. Well, Ron, thank you very much for a really great presentation. Um, and everyone else, and Ron, um, have a great weekend. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.